this was. The fact that they were turning blue actually gave this disease its first name. Many people called it the Purple Death. We now would say that that person was going kyanotic. You don't get enough oxygen into your lungs. Your skin turns blue. They couldn't really explain this. And this was in the March-April period when these young men were then going to get onto railroad cars, again, packed into barracks, railroad cars, and then packed onto ships, troop transports, 9, 10, 11,000 men being taken to Europe, crowded conditions. When those doughboys, as the soldiers were known, landed by, uh, by May of 1918, one million of them, the Spanish flu exploded across Europe. It didn't know any boundaries. It didn't respect any particular race or creed. It soon became a global pandemic because there was a war going on and ships were traveling the, war, the whole world. And every time a ship landed with an infected crew, there would be an explosion of this disease. The first phase of it ended pretty much in the summer of 1918. And this is an important piece of history that we should pay attention to. Came back again in September of 1918, more virulent, more violent, more deadly than before. And this was the phase at which it became uh, the most lethal aspect of the Spanish flu. Uh, so that's an overall picture of what this disease was, how deadly it was, and how completely connected it was to the war effort. Just to quickly explain the name, because that comes out of the war as well. Uh, it didn't start in Spain, certainly not. But Spain was a neutral nation during World War I, non-combatant, and so it wasn't censoring its newspapers the way that the United States, Germany, Great Britain, and France were. So the first published report of an epidemic in Europe, in any major city in Europe, comes out of Madrid. And they quickly name this then the Spanish flu as the newspapers, the English speaking newspapers picked this up. The Spanish, by the way, called it the Naples soldier. The Germans called it the Russian pest. The Russians called it the Chinese fever. So we, uh, we can see that there's a long history of naming diseases about some, from somebody else. Uh, we never say we're at fault here. So there are some really extraordinary lessons to be learned from the Spanish flu and what it meant in 1918. Um, and I'm sure we'll touch on some of those lessons, but certainly one of them is that censorship, which there was censorship, and that's why it became the Spanish flu, was one of the reasons that the flu spread so quickly and so devastatingly. People were not told that there was an epidemic going on. And that was one of the real prices that we paid for that secrecy. So with that pleasant introduction, um, I'm, I'm so pleased that I'm going to be able to speak to, um, to Steve, who is one of my, uh, my role models, my heroes of writing wonderful books of nonfiction for young people. And, um, and we've uh, both been working at this a long time. He more in the children's area that, than I but I've known Steve's books and read them and relied on them for research uh, in, in my own work. So it's really an honor and a pleasure for me to speak to Steve Shankin. Thank you, Ken. I feel the same exact way about you and your books inspired me as well. And I was trying to figure out how to make a transition from writing horrible textbooks to, to doing the more narrative books that I do now. Um, and, this book has been a favorite. I think Rachel mentions it maybe before we were on air, so to speak, in our house for a couple of years. And, but it's changed, don't you think? I mean, the meaning of it. Obviously, you've been doing a lot of interviews lately about it that, they're, that are completely tied to what's happening now. Um, and that's unavoidable. But, I'll, but for the first couple of questions, I want to just stick to the history and kind of build back up to parallels to what's going on. Um, although they're, like you say, they're unavoidable. I was really um, fascinated by the fact that it wasn't uh, highly reported, in, like you said, in history books throughout most of the 20th century, the way certainly World War I and II, uh, something that killed as many as 5% of the world's population. How did that, was there a specific reason for that? Just that people didn't want to talk about it? 
That's a really good and important question. And as a person who's written, uh, made a career out of writing uh, stories uh, that the school books leave out, this was a perfect setup for me in, in many respects. Uh, I, the book did come out two years ago in uh, recognition of the 100th anniversary of the, of the flu and also of the end of World War I. And again, I'm gonna keep coming back to that connection because we can't separate it. But certainly um, this story wasn't told in my school books growing up. And when you read even uh, fairly serious accounts of uh, World War I history, you don't see this, uh, this story being told. And I find it rather extraordinary that that was the case. Um, my screen has gone out. I hope everyone can still see and hear me uh, for some reason. Um, so I'm gonna uh, improvise here and hope that uh, we're, we're still, I'm still visible and audible to you all. I think what you said is exactly right, Steve, that this story was so horrible especially set against the losses of the war, that people just wanted to forget about it. I compare it to having a, a bad story in the family. You have one of those situations that, um, you know, you just don't want to talk about what Uncle Joe did because it wasn't so savory. Uh, this was like the bad family story that nobody wanted to talk about. And so it really did become uh, very much a, a piece of hidden history. Not only the history books didn't uh, discuss it, but there's really no literature about it as well. Literature in the sense of a great novel, a great play, uh, songs written about it. There are a few. There is really only a single short story that truly describes the, uh, the whole scene of 1918. And that's by Catherine Ann Porter. It's a, book, a, a short story, a long short story called Pale Horse, Pale Rider. And Catherine Ann Porter, who went on to write Ship of Fools, was a, a Denver newspaper reporter who got the flu herself and uh, nearly died from it and wrote what is probably the best literary uh, example of this. Um, the other reference to it is it's kind of fleeting. Mary McCarthy mentions the flu in her uh, memoir of uh, memory of a uh, Catholic girlhood because both of her parents died from the Spanish flu and that's why she was sent off to live with a rather awful aunt and uncle. Um, so this is not only forgotten in the history books but forgot was forgotten in the popular memory as well and it's really hard for me to imagine it when you go back and look at the scenes of horror that people describe. Situations where in a hospital or a barracks Bodies stacked like cordwood uh, was a refrain you heard over and over again. Um, but it really then did get left out of the conversation and out of the history books. Yeah, which makes it maybe harder to research, I would think. But when you, when you do look back at it, there are, it's, it's very interesting to see how people live during it. You have a picture in your book of a baseball player wearing a, a mask while playing, which who, who knows, maybe we'll see. And, and also some discussion of the government response, which the US government response, which was uneven, it sounds like, inadequate, and, and certainly tied up with issues of racism as well. Let me talk a little bit about the masks first, because that is, um, as you can see from the cover with these two boys, two newsboys, this was the image, the iconic image of the uh, Spanish flu and of course is now becoming increasingly the image of what we're living through. I'm in New York City and we are uh, on a full mask requirement to go out into the public if we are not able to maintain social distance and certainly to use public transportation. Uh, in many cities that was the law in 1918. Uh, the other thing that uh, I'm so struck by, I spent two years talking about this book, often in schools, and uh, I would wear a mask and talk about how inefficient the masks were, but then I'd always finish my lecture with two simple words, hand washing. Now we've all learned how, how important that really is. So I've been singing the hand washing song for about two years. So the masking was clearly a, a big part of the effort have to explain, go back and explain once again also that they didn't really know what they were dealing with in 1918. They didn't know what a virus was. 
uh, bacteria had been seen. They'd uh, uh, been seen for quite a while. Microscopes were powerful enough to see a bacteria, but not powerful enough to see a virus. So no one had ever seen a virus. No one understood how small it was. Um, bacteria, there had been uh, many uh, vaccines and remedies for dealing with bacteria, but nothing for a virus. Uh, people understood uh, that, that cholera existed because of parasites in, in the water, and uh, cholera had been really wiped out in most major cities by the end of the 19th century. But flu virus wasn't understood, and this, even though the idea of influenza goes back thousands of years, Hippocrates talks about it, uh, in his uh, great books about the beginning of Western medicine. So they were dealing with something they truly couldn't understand. There were very, very few doctors in America at the time to begin with. And then the war took most of them away. And it took most of the nurses away. They were asking for 25,000 nurses to go and work on the front lines. Again, comes back to this question of how quick, how significant the reaction and the relationship between the war and influenza was in 1918. They, they just can't be uh, discussed separately. And that also gets to the point of the US government's response to this. In 1918, in March and April, when the first reports of this are being made, there's really no one to report it to. There's a US Public Health Service. These were the people who were responsible for checking the immigrants in at Ellis Island to see that they weren't bringing disease in. But we had no CDC. We had no National Institute of Health. There was nowhere to report nationally an outbreak of flu. That wouldn't come about until the next uh, wave of it came in, in uh, the fall. And then the Public Health Service wanted doctors to report cases of the flu. So they were really dealing with a mystery illness that was unlike any flu they had ever seen. But the most important part of the government response was the fact that they were at war. And the whole effort of the federal government at the time was to prepare the nation to go to war and then to win the war. The public health definitely took the back burner to that effort. And I think one of the best examples of that that I can give, it runs throughout the, the book, but is uh, there's an infamous case of the parade that took place in Philadelphia in September of 1918. And I have to explain that during World War I, America was financing the war with the sale of war bonds. Back then they were called liberty loans. This was not a casual thing. This was not a relaxed thing or just a way to invest. This was something every American was expected to do. There were posters. There were men who went around to every uh, school and church and YMCA and movie theater and they'd give a four minute spiel. They were called four minute men. And you were expected to pay and you were expected to do your part. And if you didn't, you were a slacker. Well, for the fourth Liberty Loan Drive in September, Philadelphia was going to have a parade. They already knew that the second wave of this flu was out. They knew it was on some of the army bases and Navy bases in Philadelphia. And they let this parade go ahead, 200,000 people in the streets of Philadelphia because they wanted to sell these war bonds. Within two days of that parade, every hospital bed in Philadelphia was filled. Between 12 and 15,000 people in Philadelphia died in a matter of weeks. It was truly a bomb had exploded because they allowed all of these people to crowd the streets of Philadelphia and they knew there was a virus around, they knew influenza was around, and they knew that virus loves crowds. So it was the worst case scenario. If you want to talk about flattening the curve, this was the exact opposite of what to do to flatten the curve. Another aspect of the federal response that goes along with this is that President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, and General Pershing, the head of the army in, in, uh, in Europe, were both told to stop bringing the troops over, that all of these ships that were bringing men over by the thousands were just spreading more disease. But they knew that the Germans were almost defeated. This was, again, the last big offensive push 
in September, October of, of 1918. This was a six week period in which most of American casualties in uh, World War I took place in a very short period of time. But they knew that Germany could be pushed if they just gave, kept, kept the pressure up. So they kept sending the men over on what were later described as floating coffins. So the federal response really has to be seen in light of the fact that everything else took second place to the war effort. And that's an important lesson for today as well. Uh, I, I call it the lesson of misplaced priorities, whether it's selling war bonds or having a big push for a military goal, pushing this public health back was clearly what they were doing. And that was done at enormous cost to Americans uh, and, and people around the world. So the response by the federal government at the time was almost nil, partly because there was no real federal government the way we understand it. You know, the big federal government projects and, and, uh, and departments really come much later in American history, certainly under Roosevelt that begins with um, in, in the Great Depression era. But the federal government was fairly small in 1918 and most people had one thing that they got from the federal government, that was their mail. Other than that, there was not a big federal structure to help respond to this catastrophe and their eyes were on the prize of winning the war. All right. And so let's move on to the impact of it then, at least right afterwards. Um, it was profound. I mean, you could certainly argue it affected the, even the outcome of the war. But then afterwards, talk about a little bit about how it affected the course of history from that point on. The U.S. certainly changed its attitudes toward the world, toward immigration. And, and do you think the flu was, was a part of that as well? Yes, absolutely, Steve. I think that you uh, once again you can't delink the flu from from the from the war. But uh, to the point about the flu influencing the outcome of the war, there's no question that early on in the springtime, of particular, uh, when the British fleet actually couldn't sail because so many British sailors were sick, uh, French and British soldiers by the hundreds of thousands were sick that had an impact on what was going on in the trenches. This is before the arrival, uh, the mass arrival of American troops. And actually the Germans had prepared a major offensive to try and push the British and French back into the ocean before the Americans could arrive. That offensive had to be canceled because half a million German soldiers were sick with the flu. So it certainly had an, uh, an effect on the progress of the war at that time. Did it ultimately affect or change the outcome of the war? Probably not. More importantly, uh, after the war was over, which again, the war ends November 11th, the flu continues, goes well into December. A third wave comes in the uh, uh, winter of 1919. That's when uh, Woodrow Wilson goes to Paris, actually in the springtime, to negotiate what became the Versailles Treaty. Woodrow Wilson got the flu while he was in Paris. Uh, there is serious speculation, and I talk about it in More Deadly Than War, that Wilson's flu, and his doctor first thought he'd been poisoned, he was so sick, that Wilson's flu affected his judgment, his reasoning, perhaps his will, uh, and that he did things that he said he was not going to do when, before he went to Paris. Of course, that peace treaty, in 1919 shaped the course of history and still continues to today. Um, most famously, of course, someone said, well, this peace treaty isn't worth much. We'll be at war in another 25 years. It actually only took 20 years, of course, from 1919 to 1939 for the next world war. So did the flu have an impact on Woodrow Wilson at this crucial turning moment in world history? It's a, it's a, genuine question and certainly uh, has to be considered. Um, the other fascinating part that I talk about a little bit in the book is some of the people who got sick and made it, some of the survivors, certainly many people didn't survive. Uh, one was a 16 year old kid who wanted to enlist in the army and he was too young, they had to be 18, 
Then he learned that the Red Cross took 17 year olds. So he changed his birth certificate, happened to be a, a talented artist. So he fixed his birth certificate, got into the Red Cross ambulance service, got very sick, almost died, eventually got back into the ambulance service, but the war was over. His name is Walt Disney. Um, Walt Disney survived the Spanish flu just barely. Uh, another man who survived the flu was a, uh, an assistant Navy secretary who got the flu while he was in Europe touring the uh, troops in, uh, in France, came back on one of the boats that was also filled with sick men called Leviathan. He was taken to his mother's apartment, very, very sick. He was taken by ambulance. And that was Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, imagine a different world in which Walt Disney and Franklin D. Roosevelt don't survive the Spanish flu. Um, it's just part of the fascinating human side of, of this story. But to the real specifics of the impact, you know, after the war was over, America turned inward. And it turned inward in a period of intense isolationism. Uh, it was isolated and that had an impact on Wilson's great dream of a League of Nations, which didn't happen. Uh, it was reflected in the uh, uh, immigration acts that were passed in the 1920s, the first great wave of very, very profound anti-immigrant uh, laws that kept out mostly Eastern Europeans and Italians in particular, especially Southern Italians, because these were the people who were seen as dirty, diseased, and dangerous. And that's what we wanted to keep out of America. Um, it was a, a period of that isolationism and fear that led to uh, the first Red Scare in this country of Bolshevism. They had seen what happened in, in the Soviet Union, in Russia, and they didn't want Bolshevism to come here. So that was also a ref reflection of the fear that led to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, a very powerful uh, national movement, not limited to the southern states. So the flu and the world war together combined for a great period of fear, isolationism, and resistance to outside forces. The other thing on the positive side, a great many women had been called into nursing. They were called into nursing because of the war, but also because of the flu. Nursing had not been a woman's profession before then. Um, this was the Victorian era. Women weren't supposed to be see naked men, and they were much too frail to do something as uh, uh, that that uh, as as dangerous as as nursing. But nursing was a way for women to get into the professional world. The first women going into factories uh, in a massive way really is a focus of the war effort. Even though we think of that as the Ro Rosie the Riveter period. Uh, it really started in World War I. So those women had gone to war or they'd gone to factories or they'd gone to offices. They were not going back to the life they had before. So there was a profound change in America in terms of the sexes that partly comes out of the flu and the war. And I think it's no accident that we get the amendment that gives women the vote right after the war and the flu are over. So profound changes in American society that come out of the combination of the war and the flu. All right, are we, are we have time for more questions? Or do you want to for open one it more up? Official question, and then right, we can open official. it up to the audience. And then unofficial. All right, well, I have uh, a whole page still of questions, but I'm going to jump to the last chapter of your book. This was inevitable when you're writing it, I'm sure. You ask, can it happen again? Again, writing two, three years ago. And of course, you, you talked about some of the, the recent epidemics that we've experienced. Did you see this coming? Did you see parallels to what happened 100 plus years ago in our, in our modern society? It's probably the most important question we ultimately ask when we have a situation like this. And it's certainly a question that I addressed in the book. Um, and I addressed it in the sense that I didn't see this particular pandemic coming. But it seemed obvious to me, and I think we've all read a great deal in the past few months about how many people have been talking about another pandemic for a long time. And certainly when the 100th anniversary of the 1918 pandemic came up, you heard more conversations about it, but it still seemed to be in the historical and the theoretical realm, except for people who li really live and work in this, uh, in this field. 
um, people like the head of the CDC uh, back in 2018 said this question kept him awake at night. So the notion that anyone could say that this caught us by surprise, who could have imagined such a thing is just, it's a simple outright lie and we have to treat it that way. There's no way that anyone who could have been aware of pandemics and even more recent pandemics could have not been very, very aware and on a heightened set sense of alarm that this was going to happen. 1918 happened because of globalism, a global war, ships moving around the world, ships carrying people in large numbers. We live in a globalized world where the pandemic that might have been a, a, rem a, a remote part of the world and stayed there is no longer a reality. We had uh, uh, two close brushes with pandemics since 2000 in the last 20 years. Uh, Ebola, certainly one of them. Uh, we have built enormous guardrails over the past 100 years and certainly over the past 30 years to protect the international community because this has to be an international reaction. So yes, everybody who looks at this and, and worries about it knew that this was going to happen again. And every day now we seem to read more and more information about how clear it was that this particular pandemic was unfolding before our eyes and the response to it was woefully inadequate uh, at the federal level and in some cases uh, at state and local levels as well. I don't wanna really get too far into the weeds of that. But I think that there are three things that I take away from 1918 in terms of our response to the pandemic that are really important. And I've touched on a couple of them. The first is that lies, censorship, and propaganda can kill. Uh, we saw that in 1918. Uh, the propaganda then was that uh, this was something the Germans had done. It were actually uh, the belief that the Germans had brought these diseases over here. There was actually the belief that Bayer aspirin was tainted. Uh, Bayer was a German company. Aspirin was a fairly recent development, uh, the wonder drug of the 20th century. Bayer actually had to take out advertisements in America saying that Bayer aspirin was made in America by Americans because of the, the fear that somehow the, the, it was, this was tainted. So there were lies, there was propaganda, outright censorship, as I mentioned, that's one of the reasons it was called the Spanish flu because uh, papers in the United States and England weren't talking about it. The second lesson is something else I've, I've mentioned, which is even more pronounced today. That's ignoring science. When we have good advice and good scientific advice and smart people telling us something, we should listen. Uh, in 1918, the head of the Philadelphia Health Department did not listen, and thousands of people died because of that. We clearly had a poor response here because people who knew were not listened to. And so I think that's the second really deadly uh, lesson from 1918. And the last is one I, I mentioned earlier, misplaced priorities. Uh, when we put the economy, the public economy above public health, we are gambling that that is a trade-off that won't cost us a lot. Uh, I think that the, the lesson of 1918 is that the public health has to be put first. We can always replace what's lost in the economy somehow. Of course, there will be tremendous losses that eventually, presumably, they will be made up. We hope they'll do the smart thing to make them up. You can't replace tens of thousands of lives that are lost because the wrong decisions were made and public health was pushed to the side uh, in this balance between economy and health. So I think that those are three really important lessons from 1918 that we've been largely ignoring uh, right now in this current crisis. So I think that's a great place to transition to some questions from all of you. Um, before we do that, a couple of quick logistical notes. Um, first of all, we are recording this to be broadcast on or to be uh, on YouTube um, 
You will only be recorded if you speak with, you, with yourself unmuted. So if you would rather not do that, you can use the chat to ask questions and Davith or I will read them out. Um, so no pressure, you do not have to do that at all. Um, and then if you do, if you are on camera and you want to ask a question on camera, you can wave your hand and mm -hmm. either Davith or I will unmute you. Um, you can use the little uh, reaction button to put a hand up if you want, um, or you can send a note to either myself or Davith in the chat to let us know that you'd like to ask a question. But there's actually a great question already hanging out in the chat that I think we'll start with while everyone else thinks of questions, which is someone was asking, did geography or class have any influence on whether one was likely to get the Spanish flu or to die from it? Geography I'll take first. That's easier because I can say with relative certainty that geography did not help anybody in 1918. It truly, uh, apart from Antarctica, uh, it touched every continent. Uh, it touched every remote South Pacific island. And in fact, some of the remote islands of the South Pacific suffered some of the worst losses because they'd never had influenza before in the South Pacific. So when a boat lands in uh, one of the uh, South Pacific islands uh, and crew gets off and they're sick, 25% uh, of the population of the island died in really in a matter of weeks. So no geography, the same thing was very much true in Alaska. Alaska had never had this type of virus before, uh, virgin territory in, in a sense. And so there are uh, accounts and I, start the book off actually with one of them of a, of a Alaskan village where there were 80 people and somebody comes in, a missionary it be, is believed brought the disease to the village that um, 70 of the 80 people died in a matter of days in this Alaskan village. It's a fascinating science story because those villagers were then buried and their bodies were in permafrost which means they were frozen. And 70 years later, someone is able to go and recover tissue from those bodies in the permafrost that's used to actually reconstitute this virus. We have this virus today. We know exactly what it was because those Alaskans died and were buried in permafrost and there was live virus still there. Um, the way that the guy went and did this is really scary because he did not take the kind of precautions anyone would take doing that, but it's still a fascinating science story and it's kind of in the back of this book, um, told in the back of this book, exploring how they finally figured out uh, some of the secrets and the mysteries of the Spanish flu, uh, not all of which we know. We still don't know where it actually came from and how it got to the United States. There are some really interesting theories, um, one of which is that Chinese laborers who were brought from China across Canada by train, again, packing people in on trains, to the east coast of Canada, and then they were taken to uh, Europe to dig the trenches, that those Chinese laborers might have introduced this to North America. It's a theory uh, suggested, there's no way to prove it, but a fascinating um, piece of that story. So, um, so yeah, there are so many aspects of this that are, that are quite extraordinary. This is another question here we just got from uh, Latif. Uh, there's a number of good questions, but this one just popped up. Uh, what are some of the other ripple effects that the epidemic had throughout the rest of the 20th century? I would like to be able to say that this, this horrific experience created some wonderful new sense of the world having to get together to fix these things. That didn't really happen. Uh, it really took Congress about 10 years to really put together a, a package of scientific research and funding scientific research. Again, largely because the government at that time didn't do those sorts of things. We're talking about the 1920s. The economy was roaring for a while. And of course, then it all came crashing down 10 years later in 1929. But um, there was very, very little done immediately to address what had happened. Um, there was, however, in the fairly early in the history of what became the failed League of Nations, they did put together the first international health organization. 
which eventually did become what we now call the World Health Organization, or WHO, which is, you know, in the midst of some controversy, deserve it or not, we won't get into that uh, conversation too much, but there were some early attempts to make the kind of real international response uh, to this kind of pandemic that we know we need. And those, as I said earlier, those guardrails, those international guardrails of cooperation, of monitoring, of reporting of outbreaks of, of uh, uh, diseases, uh, we break those guardrails down at our own peril. And that's what the thing that I fear more than anything right now. And this administration has clearly shown that it's not really too interested in science. It's not really too interested in funding uh, scientific research and development in other countries where these pandemic diseases are most likely to emerge and eventually come to America. So we can fight them early over there or we can fight them late over here. And um, that's a decision that uh, really needs much more conversation. So a question from the chat from Catherine. Um, was how it affected different age groups. She's saying that when you walk in old cemeteries, you see so many headstones from around that time frame of very young people, and wondering if it affected older people also. One of the most interesting things about the 1918 flu, and something that's still not completely understood, is that unlike typical flu, which it tends to affect, we've all heard this, the elderly and the very young, this Spanish flu really affected healthy, otherwise healthy young people. So all of these young soldiers going off to uh, train in the camps were really being hit and knocked down in ways doctors had never seen before. There is a theory, uh, I won't get into the medical of it too, too much, that these people, uh, when you're younger and healthier, your immune system is actually stronger than it would be if you were older or very young. And this disease, was uh, elicited this very, very powerful immune response. And that response was essentially what killed you, that your lungs filled up with fluid. Your, your body sends fluid to your lungs to try and rid itself of the virus. And instead, people were actually drowning in their own body fluids. Again, turning blue because they weren't getting oxygen into their lungs. Turning blue, the purple death, kyanosis. Um, so that's one aspect of, of young people. Um, it, effect, it also created an extraordinary number of orphans. I mentioned Mary McCarthy, mem memories of a memoir of a Catholic girlhood. She was one of thousands and thousands of orphans. So there was a, 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 a moment when society had to come together to, to deal with that question. Um, one of the other young people questions was, what did schools do? And this gets to the, uh, the um, again, the government response. And it was very much left to local governments to decide. So Philadelphia uh, left its schools open, then closed them. New York kept its schools open. They believed, and this is interesting because it, it's reflected in what happened recently, they believed that children were actually better off in school where there were school nurses than they would be at home, probably in a crowded tenement. So that's what the decision that was made there. Um, Minneapolis closed its schools. St. Paul across the river left its schools open. Minneapolis had a better result than St. Paul did. So there were lots of interesting parallels um, and lessons to be learned from that. One other question that I should come back to, someone asked about the racial component of this, and there is a, an important piece of that. It was thought after 1918 that African Americans had not suffered as uh, sharply as the white uh, community had. And that may be a reflection of poor record keeping rather than the, the reality on the ground. And there's not a lot of real information to go to. But we do know that even in a place like Philadelphia, which had a, a long tradition of being a progressive uh, city and welcoming uh, the African American community, hospitals were segregated in 1918. Uh, if you were sick and black, you were sent to a very different ward, usually a, a basement, and you were going to get substandard care. So Jim Crow was part of the medical system uh, 
in 1918 America, and we have to take that into account. There's a, a wonderful story a brief, that I tell briefly in the book about African-American women who became nurses, and the army didn't want them treating white soldiers until they needed them. And then they were allowed to treat white soldiers eventually, but still segregated in their barracks. So uh, you can never get too far away from the question of talking about race when you're talking about history in America. And it was pretty ugly in 1918 as well. So I think we have time for uh, one more audience question and then I am gonna take the liberty of asking the very last question. Um, but the last audience question is, I love this one from Tim. Um, in your research, what primary source had the most impact on you um, and on you personally and on your research for the book? Primary source, that's, that's interesting because they're, they're, one of the things about this, uh, this whole pandemic was that there weren't a lot of primary sources. And again, it, there, weren't, uh, there wasn't a lot written about this. The first book that really explored the Spanish flu wasn't written until the 1970s by a man named Alfred Crosby, and he called it America's Forgotten Pandemic. Uh, he was, uh, got onto the subject because he was looking at life expectancy charts and saw that life expectancy went down in 1919. And he knew that there was a war, but he didn't think that the war could explain why life expectancy went down for the first time in a long time in American history. And he slowly, slowly began to dig through insurance reports, again, because the newspapers hadn't covered this. So um, it, it's interesting how little there was in the way of primary sources uh, until you start digging. I think some of the most interesting stuff that I did come across in terms of primary was the, uh, the reports that were made in, in and around Philadelphia, which was really probably one of the worst hit cities in America in, in 1918. Um, but again, it goes back to that question of how few people wrote a memoir of this. There's nobody who, not, not even some of the doctors who were very well known doctors, uh, mentioned this whole episode as more than a couple of paragraphs in whole autobiographies and memoirs that they wrote. So it was really a piece of hidden history and uh, the most interesting pieces I've come across are then going back and you find old newspapers uh, that were covering especially the second wave when it was really known as the Spanish flu. Much harder to find any references to it early on but it's uh, heartbreaking and shocking to hear the same people say time and time and again that the bodies were stacked like cordwood. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I came across that in letters or doctor's reports. Um, doctors in New York City saying the people were coming in, they're blue as huckleberries and they're dropping and they're dropping and, and spitting blood you read those kind of grotesque stories and, and those have a pretty chilling and extraordinary effect on you. Um, so I, uh, I'm struggling a little bit to, to, to say there was one particular primary source, but uh, there, there are wonderful sources. There are also a great many people who survived uh, from childhood and told about it much later on when, when people started to go back and look at what this uh, period was like. Uh, children in Philadelphia, for instance, who talked about being the runners because children weren't getting sick as much. They were the ones who had to go out and get the groceries and bring home uh, food to the family. It's a pretty extraordinary moment in our history. Wow, thank you so much. So Ken has been talking about his book, More Deadly Than War. Um, Davith is going to very nicely put a link in the chat if anyone would like to order that from northshire.com. We would be very grateful. Those orders are keeping us going. Um, and I, as I said, I'm going to take the liberty of asking the last question, which is, Ken, I would love it if you would talk a little bit about your next book, which is coming out this fall. And I think Davith will humor us with a link to pre-order in the chat, if anyone's interested in that, as Ken starts talking about it. Uh, the book, uh, it happens to be right here in the advanced copy. It's called Strongman, The Rise of Five Dictators and the Fall of Democracy. And um, in it, I really tell the story of how um, Hitler, uh, Mussolini first, Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, and uh, Saddam Hussein all come to power 
and uh, especially the stories of Mussolini and Hitler, I think, are so important because they did not come at the, uh, the head of a, uh, an army. They didn't ride into their uh, capitals in tanks. They were uh, men who took power in democracies, constitutional democracies. And we hear the expression, democracy dies in darkness, but it doesn't. It often dies in broad daylight while thousands, if not millions, are cheering. Uh, so that's a really important story, it seems to me, for our time, because democracy is under assault, uh, not just in the last three years. It has been under assault for the last 20 years around the world and, to my mind, in this country. And um, it can vanish very quickly overnight. So this is a story of how these men were able to come to power, how they were able to bring along whole countries at enormous cost in lives, of course. And um, it, it, these are terrible stories, but they're terribly important to understand as well. And before I run out of time, I just wanna say how grateful I am for the opportunity to come back to the North Shire, even virtually. For a long time, the North Shire was my um, hometown bookstore in Vermont when uh, I used to have a home there. And, um, and uh, it's a very, very special place to me. And uh, it's, uh, I, I'm so pleased that I was able to um, do this this way. Old dogs are learning new tricks in a new age of, um, of Zooming all over the place. And this has been a great pleasure for me. So thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Northshire. And thank you, Steve. It was a great pleasure to talk with you. Well, thank, thank you. you so much, Kenneth. It really, um, one of my fondest memories from the Saratoga store is your event for In the Shadow of Liberty. So it's really a treat to get to see you again. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. It's really a nice thing to get to see all of your friendly faces. We'll be doing this again on Thursday um, with Jennifer Dugan celebrating her book, Verona Comics. She is a local-ish author. She lives not too far away and we were lucky enough to host the launch for her book, Hot Dog Girl, last year. And we were supposed to be hosting the launch for Verona Comics uh, this past weekend. So she'll be joining us on Thursday and the password will once again be Verona. So um, come join us again on Thursday and thank you so much everybody. Thank you, Ken. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all so much. Ken Davis's book is The Hidden uh, is More Deadly Than War, The Hidden History of the Spanish Flu in the First World War. Live from Northshire. Thank you all so thank much. Thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of your evening. <laughs>